This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Pauline Schuckmark, Jr., host for We Like the 1%. We Like the 1% is a show about individuals and entrepreneurs. And today, we're going to be following the entrepreneurial journey of Peter Merck, the founder of the beauty company Arbonne. My guest today, joining us via Skype from California, is the founder's son, Stian Merck, who is managing director of Arbonne International. Hi, hi, Stian. Hi, hi, Pauline. How are you? Very well. Aloha. How are you? I am wonderful. Thank you for having me on your show. I really appreciate it, and and uh, just good to be here. Thank you. And uh, now, before we get to your father's story, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, of course, uh, Pauline. Um, Missy, where do I begin? I have. I am uh, originally uh, born and raised in Norway. Uh, I came. Uh, I left Norway uh, at age of 16. I went to uh, high school in the UK, and I came to the US in my late teens. And I studied um, uh, in San Francisco, at the University of San Francisco, for about five years, and got my uh, couple of degrees there, and started to work in Arbonne in 1989, and uh, moved uh, uh, with that to uh, Orange County, Southern California, beautiful, sunny Southern California, Indeed. where, uh, you know, my work and uh, where I eventually uh, uh, married and kids and cats and dogs and you know what. So that's, uh, that's kind of uh, my story in a nutshell. I've been uh, with Arbonne for well, close to 30 years. And um, and uh, I have grown kids, pretty grown kids by now. Mm -hmm. um, I love it here in uh, in Southern California because it's um, it's just you know beautiful climate, uh, good people. I love the outdoors. I love the ocean. I love the mountains. And here in Southern California, in the right time of year, you can swim, uh, and two hours later you can be skiing in the mountains. So it's one of those things. Uh, I love it very much. And I you know so Arbon has been a big part of my life and and uh, exciting journey in Arbon uh, for for the past almost 30 years. So that's kind of my story in a nutshell right there. And uh, Stian, do you still have family in Norway? Do you still commute to Norway? Yeah, so I, uh, in fact, uh, you know, we just uh, had holidays. My mother was here in California. So this time of year, everyone loves to come to California because <laughs> it's uh, nicer and warmer than, than back in Norway. But yes, I have a mother who was here. I have a sister and a brother who's uh, back in Norway as well, as well as kids and, and all kinds of uh, things. So siblings and friends and family. And I, I thankfully get to go over once or twice a year and I bring my family and try to give them the, you know, the, the, the heritage and the, the, try to establish some roots for them uh, in Norway. I have a, my daughter lives there full time. So we, we are connected, uh, well connected, California and Norway for sure. That's wonderful. And you're right. It's not so easy to go to the beach in Norway. I, I've been there one time. Oslo is a beautiful city. I haven't been to Trondheim yet. But I did go to your summer resort. I, I'm, I hope I pronounce it correctly. Is it Kragere? Kragere, yes. yes. That's Kragere. the beautiful part of Norway, southern part. Uh, yes. my, my answer Beautiful, is... beautiful uh, in the summertime. Yes. Although no. also winter, but it's cold. <laughs> it's, it's known as a summer resort in Norway. And it's very quiet throughout the year, except during the summer when it gets uh, quite, quite crowded, actually. Very, popular. very, very crowded. Lots of boats and everything. Lots it's, of people. It's a shipbuilding city, yes. So uh, yeah. now we're going to focus on Arbon, the company that your father founded, and let's just talk about your father because he sounds like he has a fascinating journey in establishing this company. So can we start off with a little bit how your uh, father came from Norway all the way here to uh, Southern California? Yeah, so that is a very fascinating story, and I could spend hours. I know we don't have uh, time for that, but he basically uh, uh, was was born in uh, at the very beginning of the Second World War, and so he grew up in uh, in uh, in that time in Norway, and um, as was common in uh, in Norway in those days, the 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 young men were often often didn't have much opportunity, so he became a sailor, um, and uh, it, uh, be became a part of the sort of the Norwegian merchant marine. Um, 
So actually, at the age of 15, so he had he had a, a mother, a single mom, raised him, and two siblings. And at age of 15, he left Norway and became a sailor. And for 10 years, those very formative years of 15 to 25, he was actually out in the big wide world. Um, uh, you know, whatever whatever you do when you're that age, out in the big world in the in the 50s and the 60s, and spent. Um, about five years in Australia, and the stories that he told me uh, of those days, I will never forget, but uh, very interesting, very, very sort of, uh, uh, how does it, broad and, and diverse uh, experiences that he had. Can, can you tell uh, one, one very good story? Well, you know, he was, uh, so in Australia, he was, uh, he did all kinds of things. He lived out in the bush and... Uh, he was, uh, you know, he would sell shells at the beach, and he would work. He bumped into a fellow Norwegian that uh, sort of took care of him, I think, because I think my father uh, wasn't really good at taking care of himself back in those days. Mm. But uh, you know, interesting stories how he had he jumped ship without the passport in the Philippines, and <laughs> and oh, you know, you name it, uh, it, ha it happened. But he, you know, he saw he saw the good and he saw the bad, uh, mm. and I think that really shaped him a lot. I think that. When he eventually came back to Norway, uh, aged around 25, I think he was driven to to kind of make his mark and 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 really establish something and create a legacy. And so he he was an entrepreneur, always was. Started many businesses uh, in Norway. Um, there's conscription, so usually at the age of 18 you go to the military and spend a year there. He was traveling when that happened and. Um, came to the military and was 25, and he told me stories there, what kind of like business ventures he did there, mm. but he was always buying and selling and, and starting businesses and, and um, uh, you know, uh, basically got into the, into the, um, into the beauty, uh, beauty space uh, in the 60s uh, and, and started a, uh, a business, the very successful business in the direct selling channel uh, in Norway in the 60s that he was engaged with for many years. And Stian, why did he select beauty as the sector <coughs> to do his enterprise in? Well, so I think it, it, in, in some ways it sort of uh, happened by accident. So he was, you know, involved in many different uh, kind of businesses and, and uh, he, uh, he was employed uh, as the sales manager for a, um, uh, for a, a Company that manufactured skincare and cosmetic products in Norway, and he was responsible for getting these products, uh, and, and you know, getting new business and so on, getting products out in the marketplace. And Norway in those days was a small, poor country, uh, and uh, and uh, when he saw then when he saw these products come across the line, that uh, you know he the, the, some products caught caught his attention, and he he was able to. Um, to contact the people that had started this business uh, that he actually eventually then started in Norway. So it was sort of by accident uh, in a way that he was just engaged in a, in a, in a sales management uh, position and uh, you know how one door opens and more door opens and that's kind of, so sort of by accident, but and for him it was interesting because um, he was always very much in, involved with, I don't know, just you know, he liked products and consumable products, and uh, and uh, these were products that uh, piqued his interest. And um, uh, he was, you know, pretty quickly he discovered that there may be a better way to make products than how they were being made back in the 60s with a kind of ingredients and so on that were that was commonplace back in those days. So he pretty much immediately started to to explore ways to make products more natural, more botanically based, which became essentially the foundation of Arbonne. That's why Arbonne started, because he created products that were were different and better uh, in his mind and then what existed um, in the marketplace in the 60s and the 70s. And the primary product lines associated with Arbonne are skin care, nutrition, personal care, and cosmetics. Is that correct? That's correct. So back in the early days, it was just skincare, really, and then small line of, of makeup. But really, essentially, we're you know skincare company, and it's more recently, I'd say in the last ten years or so, that we have really uh, embraced nutrition, and our our community has really embraced uh, 
you know, the, the, the nutrition side as well. So this, the, now it's, our big focus is the inside uh, and outside, and, you know, in health and wellness from inside out, if you like. So it's a, more of a, a comprehensive overall approach to the, to the product line. And these products have very good characteristics associated with them. A lot of them are vegan certified. They are cruelty free, which is important to a lot of consumers of these types of skincare products. So yep. um, it's, it's quite a great endeavor. So can you tell us a little bit about your father as a boss? <laughs> well, he, he, was a, he was a great father. Uh, uh, and uh, I enjoyed, uh, have lots of good memories with him as a father. As a boss, he was driven. All I can tell you that uh, the years that we worked together, um, you know, there was really there was nonstop Arbon. It was breakfast, lunch, and dinner, really. And uh, it, but that's what I wanted as well, and that's what everyone around him wanted. And they wanted to be part of that energy and that passion that he had. And he shared that with people, and people that were able to hang on and keep up. They uh, it was an amazing experience. But he was uh, he was tough. He was. Uh, he had high expectations of people, for sure. These are always the most excellent types of bosses because they have very high standards and they have a vision. And uh, as you said, people have to keep up because it's like McKenzie, you're up or out, right? Is that how it was with Peter? <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. I think so. I mean, I think he, he appreciated people bringing different strengths to, to the table, to the business. But he really, if, if he... Uh, if, if he sort of didn't really think that you brought something of value to the table, then I don't think that he really cared that much. So he was always seeking uh, to enhance and bring, you know, people that could bring value to the table and to the business, you know, in, in one way or another. So it wasn't, it was sometimes the people that he embraced weren't uh, the obvious candidates always. There were people that, you know, would, would think uh, for themselves and have different ideas, uh, um, and uh, and you know would bring something maybe surprising to the table. So he was surrounded by a lot of a lot of really good people that brought you know was a very interesting um, and entertaining uh, group of people always very creative, uh, yeah. very fun. How would you categorize his leadership style or management style? So he was approachable. You mentioned he's approachable. Oh yeah, very much, very much so. He was very very approachable, and uh, he really. He he was, uh, and maybe this was because of his own journey, but he was very interested and very curious about people and really wanted to get deeply under the skin of people. And he would spend, you know, you know, more time than maybe you would expect with sort of some somewhat of an ordinary person because it caught his interest. And he would learn from everybody. It wouldn't have, didn't have to be a, a very important or you know, in, in, in sort of uh, an important person necessarily for him to really be engaged. It could be, um, you know, more of a more of a, a normal person, and he would find things with uh, with his people that was outstanding or special. And did he start off with a very large team of advisors, uh, that sort of thing, or was he basically at that well, time? Yeah, at that time, this was thirty-seven years ago. Is that correct? So yeah, so so definitely. I mean, it's the industry is a small industry that the uh, the direct uh, selling industry, as well as the um, you know the skincare and the cosmetic industry is not is not. I mean, it's it's giant, but there's a few key players, and I think that in those early years. Um, he made a lot of friends and a lot of connections. So he had a really good support team around him, not necessarily of, of uh, professional advisors. I would say more of just people that liked him and that wanted to, wanted to support him. Uh, and uh, it was through those connections, those friends, if you like, I think that that helped push him forward and help him create those initial products and that initial, you know, uh, to help him define sort of the vision around the product and. Um, and the opportunity, and and uh, but obviously, and as we launched, we were a tiny company. But over the years, and one of the beauties of our of our model is that essentially we're we're a people business, and That's and right. you'll only succeed when you're able to surround yourself with really clever, smart people that can help. Uh, build a, a grow your vision. So. Okay, Stian, that's great. We're get, we'll get more into how the business model, how the corporate structure is of our bond after we take this quick break. So we'll be right back after we take this break. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present 
Think Tech Hawaii's research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me one o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's research in Manoa. Aloha, I'm Winston Welch, and every other Monday at 3 p.m., you can join me at Out and About, a show where we explore a variety of topics, organizations, events, and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. So please join us every other Monday at 3, and we'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha, everyone, and welcome back. We're speaking with Stan Merck of Arbonne International. So, Stan, uh, we're going to now discuss uh, a little bit about the corporate structure of Arbonne because there are sometimes some misunderstandings with this type of a company. And uh, they are commonly, they used to be referred to more as MLMs or multi-level marketing companies. And it's more appropriate to call them network marketing companies. Is that correct? Yeah, so uh, I, I think uh, what we, uh, we we refer to ourselves as a social marketing company. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the the uh, it's really uh, we're a direct sales company, which simply means that we mm -hmm. uh, you can't really buy our products in any fixed retail location. We uh, market our products directly from from the consultant from uh, from our consultant directly to the end user. Uh, which you know, this is a business model that's been in existence for hundreds of, I mean, forever. It's, it's like the oldest business model. It's referred to as the Tupperware model, and uh, companies. Yeah, I mean, many. So, so you know, there's many different actors and many different companies uh, in our space, but uh, um, you know, that's essentially what it is. It, it's it's a it's a uh, you know, and, and 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 the way that we compensate our our sales force is really. Uh, uh, it's unique to Arbonne, uh, but uh, you know our consultants are independent contractors; they're not employees, mm -hmm. and they are out there because they love to be part of Arbonne. They all love our products, and they all love to share the opportunity that goes along with the product that we uh, that we have. So, um, you know, in some ways, they are volunteers out there building their own businesses, and to whatever extent and whatever time they want to put into it, they can do. So, we have people that are. That have that are very very part time, and then we have uh, some consultants that work this full time like a business and uh, make good incomes. And as far as social network marketing companies go, there there are many of them. People can research this online, but Arbonne is one of the few that has a very good reputation. And uh, what you find is a lot of the products from these companies focus on the female market. Most of them are around skincare, cosmetics. Arbonne is slightly unusual. You have a broader product range in that you have a male product line. And you don't have as many male independent consultants, but uh, my father is one, so um, he enjoys. <laughs> yeah, my father is a dental surgeon, and he's been in practice for 45 years, and he endorses the fluoride-free toothpaste that is one of the products under the personal care line. And um, as you mentioned, uh, these are these are products that are not sold in stores, so you need to know a current consultant because in order to place the product, you need to input a certain ID number for a consultant. So in this example, for any viewers and listeners watching here in Hawaii or elsewhere, my as an example, my father's consultant number is 24177302, and you would input that when you visit the Arbonne International website and pick the country that you're in. And it is a transnational or transregional type of system. So even if the person wants to purchase something in Australia, it doesn't matter that my father is in California. So is, that's a fairly ca uh, accurate representation, Sian. That's correct. That's correct. So one of the you know our our business is really only as good as the business of our consultants. And and so what we everything we do. Our role is simple, really. We, we, we make a really good product, and we make sure that we do a lot of uh, the heavy lifting that a, a normal business person would have to do in her business. So we take care of the product. We'll take the order. We'll ship the order. Um, we'll uh, provide reporting and, 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 and marketing materials and training and collateral. So you, uh, the independent consultant, can actually go out there and, and share the product 
and tell the story and, and, and bring people into the business if that's what you want to do. So we try to keep it very simple uh, and duplicatable so, uh, you know, so it'll grow. And that's, that's our business model. It works great. Uh, every single sale that comes into the company goes back out to the field one way or another. So in the case you just mentioned, if someone just wants to go to Arbonne.com, they can, they, can, um, they can place an order, but that, that the commission for that order will be assigned to someone uh, out uh, in the field, wherever uh, you know, wherever um, you know, the nearest consultant is, based on some algorithm. But it's uh, you know, our job is to make sure that our consultants have good businesses, and so that makes it kind of simple. We are partners, and we want their success. And you, even though you are headquartered in Irvine, California, you have Arbonne in seven areas in the world, right, in, uh, including America. So can you just name the areas? Yeah, correct. So we're in the United States. Uh, we're in Canada. Uh, we're in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we are in the UK and we're in Poland. And uh, most recently, we opened up in Taiwan. Yes. So those are our markets. Um, and um, and you have a yeah, special you have a special product line for Taiwanese clients, such as the, because uh, skin whiteners are very popular in Asia. So uh, right. yes, so you have a special yeah, line, so skincare line. Absolutely. So so we need to we need to you know for the most part our products are consistent throughout the markets, but we definitely look at a certain market, and if we need to adjust uh, our products or our product offering to that market, we will do that. And in the Arbonne website, the company is described as being of Swiss heritage. So your father was Norwegian. So can you explain uh, to the listeners and viewers the Swiss connection with Arbonne? Yeah. So, uh, so the Swiss connection is, you know, when I talked about uh, so the 60s, 60s and the 70s and the people that he was surrounded by, that he surrounded himself with, uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, a lot of those people were Swiss, and some of the best laboratories and uh, formulators and so on were Swiss. And the, the, there was a, a, um, a meeting in the northern town of Switzerland called Arbon, A R B O N, mm -hmm. on Lake Constance. That um, um, uh, I wasn't there, but there were my father and some, some of his friends and some of his collaborators uh, met there. And uh, and that's sort of where the where Arbon sort of came to be, if you like. That's where the sort of the idea was really finalized. And I think uh, uh, he, in honor of that little town, he he named the company Arbon. So he added an N and an E uh, <laughs> to make it uh, sound a little better and be a little better. And uh, but that's the story. So the Swiss connection is really our our products were originally formulated in Switzerland. <laughs> Um, and uh, eventually, you know, now our our uh, global headquarters and R and D and so on happens here in California. But we leverage, you know, the best people and the best ingredients uh, anywhere in the world where you find them. So we still, uh, you know, we're still, you know, now more of a global company. Uh, with the, with the, but our heritage is, def is definitely Swiss. So you mentioned that the, uh, the laboratory is in the headquarters in Irvine. Can you tell us a little bit about your scientific team? Right. So we have we actually we have a, a lab here in Irvine, and we also have a sister company uh, in uh, up in Los Angeles, um, where a lot of R and D is happening. We have a uh, so we have a lot of people, you know, scientists that uh, all they do is is uh, formulate uh, products and, uh, and so on. We also have a scientific advisory board uh, made up of uh, several people from different uh, backgrounds that uh, advise us, help us with, with anything that has to do with, um, with product, whether it be skincare or nutrition, uh, just to help us support uh, our mission of, of bringing you know, the very best products to market. And uh, you also listen to your consultants. The independent consultant input is taken to, into account when a new product is being created. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So we get a lot of our, our, our inspiration from our field, from our, from our customers. Um, and uh, of course, we look at what's happening in the marketplace um, with what, what is going to work for us. But absolutely, the field and our, our, our end users are, are a very important part of helping drive our product development efforts. And how many, approximately how many consultants, uh, independent consultants, are with Arbonne at the moment? 
You know, I think we have uh, in the neighborhood of 200,000 consultants. That's quite a lot, uh, and that's worldwide, globally. yes. Worldwide and uh, approximately, I would say, about a million preferred clients. Mm -hmm. so these are people that uh, would be able to, to, to shop with Arbonne at a discount, and our consultants are the people that uh, are able to build a business with Arbonne, bring in, build it, you know, they, they can sponsor and bring in preferred clients and other consultants and build a team as well. And is Arbonne looking to expand further? I, I was told that there is a new launch coming up. Uh, is that something you can discuss? Yeah, absolutely. So we have announced that we are going to uh, be in Germany this year, in 2018. The dates have not been uh, uh, announced yet. Uh, we're still working out uh, some of those details, but uh, very, very excited about Germany, which is uh, the biggest market in Europe, and I believe the fourth biggest market for us in our space in the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Germans are um, very, um, we need to do it very well. So yes. we're making sure that we cross all the T's and all the I's. They do everything uh, by the book. <laughs> absolutely. So it is a, it's a great opportunity for us, and we're excited about that. And uh, our, our, our field uh, in all markets are very excited about the opportunity to go to Germany and, and share our products and eventually share our opportunity there. And Stian, uh, we're almost out of time, but can you explain why Arbon comes to Hawaii every year? You go specifically to Maui, is that correct? Uh... Right, so yeah, well thank you because of bringing it all back home. I, yes. I am in love with uh, the Hawaiian Islands, um, been there many, many times. Um, we come there um, once a year with our very top senior uh, leaders to, uh, to sort of celebrate the year that passed and to kick off the new year. So we were just in, 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 uh, in Maui, in uh, Wailea, um, at a beautiful property there, and uh, launched uh, new products, uh, new tools and, and trainings, and, and just as a place for people to get together and network and be together. and. And it's like, you know, community building, but it's at the leadership level and we go there to really, yeah, because we love the islands and we love to shower our, uh, our consultants with, you know, the best that there is. And I can't think of a better place than, uh, than, uh, than Maui. Oh, yes, you have exquisite taste. This is the best place. <laughs> All the islands. You, you have to expand. As you expand your business, you have to come to a lot of the other islands as well. They're all beautiful. Uh, know, except for, well, Kahoho, Lawe, and Niihau are a little bit tricky, but the others are all fair games. So. We have, we've been there. We've been there. We love yeah. them all. But uh, right now, it just happens to be Maui is the place we go to. Okay, brilliant, Stian. Thank you so much for joining us here on We Like the 1% on Think Tech Hawaii. And I'll see everybody next Thursday at 11 a.m.